Johnny Waxes. What the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah, man. Who are you? you? <laughs> I'm look. I, I let my hair grow a little bit <laughs> here in Portugal. You are not <laughs> booty cheap, booty tie. What's yeah, happening? <laughs> I'm straight out of the chat, and I took Buriti's place. Um, it's a it's an honor to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Rodrigo. Oh no, the honor um, is mine. I'm just a little a little titty titty bit nervous right now. No, it's just this is normal. This is don't don't worry about that. We always be nervous when we invite someone like your guest today, uh, your guest, uh, because uh, always is a huge challenge for us. You know that. You, you watched, right? Yeah, I do. I do, but yeah. it's not the same feeling at all. It's not, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, stay, it stay, it stay here at this. I will. At I'll this try. place. <laughs> I'll do my best. Let's see what happens. No, but I, but I invite you because I know that you 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 has a you have a, a great position, questions, and you think like us, like Burichi. So that's the reason why I invite you because I know you are a provocative guy. So not that much. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, not Let's not, the same. <laughs> not yeah. the same. Not the same. No one is like Burichi, and we yeah, love you, Burichi. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, dude. <laughs> but I choose you to stay here with us because you're your ambassador, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> You always invite people to like our videos, to to stay with us. So now you're here. Speaking of which, let me just do a brief pause and click the like button below, share, subscribe, and comment below what you think is gonna happen. What did you think about the episode? And yeah, share spread it around spread the word yeah and tell us please watch the interview and tell us what you think and uh are you anxious oh man i don't even know what to say i mean that's a heavy hitter <laughs> uh, what i what can i say without i mean everybody has read the name right now he's the yeah. polar bear guy just the polar bear guy yeah yeah i, I guess Jeez, I, I don't even know man I don't okay. know. i'm so anxious right now <laughs> i understand you don't worry because like i said always i i'm getting nervous because the people who we are inviting it's a have uh, knowledge about user experience design, product technology. The last one was Mark Kagan. I don't know if you, if you did. You watch the Mark Kagan interview? Did you? <laughs> if you didn't go watch it. <laughs> okay, so let's call our next guest. Let's. So, Let's do that. So come on, Mr. Louis Rosenfeld or Rosenfield. I will ask him. Okay. Yeah, Louis. Lou. Louis. Okay. <laughs> come on. <laughs> First of all, I'm happy and grateful you are here with us. It's a great pleasure to have professionals and reference like you in your show. Uh, it's a, a great experience for me. I'm a little bit nervous, like I said before. <laughs> so, <laughs> both. <laughs> and uh, to start, perhaps someone doesn't know you. I doubt, but perhaps. Uh, I want to ask you to quickly introduce yourself. Can you talk about you a little bit, please? Sure. Uh, uh, I uh, was once a librarian and I... Uh, was lucky to be a young guy when the internet and especially the web became big and even before. And I um, believed that uh, librarianship had a role in helping people uh, organize and make more findable uh, all the information that was exploding or about to explode on the internet. 
which it did. And uh, um, many of us called that information architecture. And uh, so I, I had a business and co-wrote a book with my friend Peter Moraville. People call it the Polar Bear book because of the cover and um, was very involved in the community of inf and uh, information architecture community, helped um, start the Information Architecture Summit, which is now the Information Architecture Conference. Uh, and so um, worked in that area for, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years, um, was an, ind uh, an independent consultant and then started moving more into user experience design because I found that um, very compelling um, an area of practice because it brought together all kinds of different perspectives on how people could have experiences. Uh, and that's always been very appealing to me is when different minds and, and perspectives come together. And so I became very involved in user experience, started a company, Rosenfeld Media, as a hobby because I felt we needed to have more books on user experience design and I wanted to be a publisher. So I launched that and we, um, I think we have about 50 books that we've published and we've also expanded into the conference business. We do five conferences a year, we offer training and uh, we're all about curating really great content and conversations. And so that's what I do now full time is um, I curate the curators at Rosenfeld Media. Oh, what a journey. Podcaster, publisher, author, producer, among many other things. How do you get so much time? <laughs> I don't. But, you know, I try to, I try to be uh, uh, very efficient because, you know, I, for example, I started podcasting because I, I get to have these great conversations with people like yourselves. And just like you're capturing this conversation, I... I started to think I should be doing the same. I should just record these conversations because they often happened on Zoom. And now I've, I don't know, I think I've, I've done about 200, 210 podcasts and more on the way. So um, it's just a matter of being efficient and loving what you do. And I really do love what I do. I have the best job in the world. I get to talk to really smart people all the time about their work. And they're really happy to share with me uh, because we love what we do in this field. And uh, I, I get to be um, talking to like such brilliant and interesting people every day. So it really, it's not an issue of time. It's because uh, it, it's fun and I learn all the time. Well, I think this is the secret, right? Passion and love. So this is a good tip for all, all of us here. And I'd like to know, you brought about your work as a publisher of great books and your relationship with great authors. I would like to know your view on the challenge of teaching design and the connection to the future of the work of designers with a focus on digital products. How do you see where you are doing it right and where we must pay attention to the potential mistakes we are making today. Well, I, you know, one of the really great things is that there are so many more opportunities both to study and practice the, our craft. Uh, you know, most of the people in my generation are self-taught. Um, and now there are all kinds of boot camps and, and academic programs and, and other opportunities to learn in a more formal way how to be a UX designer, researcher, writer. And then, of course, there's so many work opportunities. Um, even here in the States with all the layoffs, there are many jobs that have not been filled in our field. So there's still a lot of organizations and a lot of different sectors that are hiring. Uh, th there's certainly more work out there than, than people can do. Now, the problem that I see is that um, we maybe either end the education without really getting into the kind of people skills that are required to be successful in most settings, or um, we may need to redefine the craft as beyond the, the work <laughs> to include 
the opportunities to communicate, to negotiate, to convince, to present, to understand, to listen. These are all things that are very difficult to teach and often are not really going to be addressed until you're in a job and you're struggling. And then despite the, the craft skills you may have, suddenly you realize it's not enough. And really the books and conferences that we do are, are for people who are three to five years into their careers. We don't have a lot of introductory material that would be traditional craft teaching. It's really more for the people who have a lot of the basics of craft, but now want to go to a higher level with their craft and also be successful in organizations and pick up the people skills that they don't have today, at least not when they start off their careers. So um, where do the people skills fit? How do we teach them? And um, why aren't the programs that are teaching uh, new designers and researchers doing more to acknowledge those challenges of the need to learn people skills? That's really interesting. So following the same uh, path, what are your thoughts on how boot camps, there's a lot of them all around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think they're tackling the information architecture, education? How do you think it reflects on the field as a whole? Well, uh, you know, uh, look, I've never attended a boot camp. I know something about them. Uh, I appreciate any time people want to teach as well as want to learn. I, I would never discourage the idea of t of being part of a boot camp. That said, um, boot camps are in many cases, you know, very much for profit companies. That's there's nothing wrong with that. I'm in a for profit company, uh, mine. But education um, is can be really difficult with a for profit model because it treats the learners as consumers, as customers. And when that happens, you end up giving them what they want rather than what they need, uh, which can mean you're giving them learning that is obvious and that they can pick up in nine months or six months. And things like information architecture, service design are beneath the surface and work at a more macro level. And so uh, if I have to rush my student through a boot camp, the curriculum I design for them may de-emphasize those deeper systematic or systemic pursuits like information architecture that are not obvious, that are beyond the front end. Uh, boot camps um, also, because they are money-making organizations for the most part, their businesses um, often promise things that they can't deliver. They make guarantees about getting hired. Uh, and some of them are um, very good about it. I, I know of some boot camps that have a whole program for what you should be doing after you graduate. And if you follow their program and still don't get a job, they'll reimburse you or they'll credit you for the money you spent on their program. They'll give you your money back. But most don't operate that way. Most make promises. And then there's really very little recourse for students to make sure that these boot camps honor those promises. So the two areas I'd say are problematic is when you are thinking of your students as customers, you don't necessarily show them the skills that go beyond the surface cosmetic. And uh, you make promises to them that you may not be able to keep. And I think there's a little misunderstanding of what a boot camp is and isn't, right? You see like two month courses selling themselves as boot camps or promising that you get out of there and get a job and earning like exactly. 15k a month so i guess that's 
that's a failure that that I don't know whose failure is that, but I think that's uh, an issue we should tackle. Maybe it's a failure point. of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> wow, really, this is a uh, good conversation. We can start right now. <laughs> yeah, let's fix it. Uh, we, uh, my friend Dave Hoffer, another UX guy, is always talking about we need to redesign capitalism. But that you should all you know, interview him for your next podcast. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's really difficult. If, if I have two months to learn something in a boot camp and I'm a, a new person, new to the industry, maybe what would be reasonable would be to learn the language. What is the language of design or UX or whatever the focus is? If you can learn the language, that's often half the battle. A language, a terminology, a jargon is It offers almost a map of a domain that helps you make sense of that domain. There's other ways to map a domain, but that's a good one because ultimately, if you know the language, you can now have conversations with people in the domain, you can read about it and so forth. And um, that might be the one thing a boot camp should and maybe could do in a short amount of time. Anything past that seems Even, even the basics of craft seem a little ambitious. I yeah. totally agree with that. Yeah, and we can see that kind of movement here in Brazil, right? That we are on the on a basic path without deepening or expanding our knowledge here in Brazil. Uh, but we are trying to do different, like this conversation here try to open minds and guys come on let's let's go deep right i want your view on the design scale today how do designers today need to prepare for such a large field of activity to be ready to work through design within companies interesting question how can you prepare um well uh, we've talked a bit about soft skills or people skills, better term for it. Uh, and those, you're, it's, I mean, listen, we've got books and conferences and training, but the, 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 the requirement to start picking up those skills to be able to navigate what's typically a large political organization with different silos and different practices and, and so on, you have to have an open mind and an open heart So you have to be like uh, all the learning in the world won't help you unless you acknowledge that you need to learn how to navigate those environments and that you need to pick up people skills. If you acknowledge it and you open yourself up, then there's a good chance that you'll learn. Otherwise, it'll just take a long time, much longer. But beyond that, um, I love the model, and I learned about this from uh, uh, Peter Bogard's, uh, uh, a Dutch UX guy some years ago, the model of the, the T-shaped designer. Are you familiar with the T-shaped designer? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'll just explain it briefly. The T-shape is, um, if you think of the horizontal part of the T uh, covering breadth, but, uh, uh, but not much depth in terms of skills. And then the long vertical part of the T is an area of depth that you might have. So in other words, if you are a designer in any kind of setting where there's a lot of complexity and a lot of people working and a lot of challenges in terms of research, design, whatever it might be, you need to at least have the big picture that breadth without much depth so that you can have conversations with people who know something that you don't so that you can empathize with them so that you can understand what their motivations are. Those are the people you're working with. You need to be part of a team. And so you need to understand and be able to have conversations with those people. And then there's the area that you have depth in. You might be an expert at interaction design. You might be an expert at information architecture, service design, something else. And, uh, you know, then you, you 
have to cultivate both of those. You can't just, you know, uh, I have enough depth now. I'm just going to concentrate on breath. Breath it doesn't work that way. You have to really be working in both areas. Uh, by the way, you mentioned some people earlier uh, that you that you've talked to recently, and just today I happened to talk with Christian Cromlish and Steve Portugal. <laughs> just today, uh, so um, it's a small world. That must have been a really good talk, right? Oh yeah, great to talk to those guys. <laughs> For you, it's easy to speak with them, right? <laughs> Oh, they tolerate me. <laughs> Amazing. And uh, interesting point, because I recorded a video last week about T-shape it. And how important is this to, to, to see the, how the, the expanded knowledge to de generate great insight? So I agree with you. I think it's very important to see uh, this, the horizontal part of the T-shape to bring a vision of specialities, et cetera, right? So good point. There, there's, there's also one other area that really, uh, sh you know, uh, merits mention. And, you know, that is um, a perspective of inclusivity. So, you know, we are not only designing for very complex environments, uh, but we're also uh, designing for very diverse audiences. And uh, if you are going to um, design for them, you have to try, first of all, to build teams that are reflective of the audiences and are diverse themselves. And, the, you know, a lot of the discussion diversity, certainly white guys like me get really uncomfortable uh, because it, it feels like we're being asked to do something that's unnatural for us, to go beyond our networks, to go beyond the people who look like us. And I think it's really more uh, an issue of, again, being open and looking to learn uh, and, uh, and make mistakes along the way. Um, and so, like, if you are open and conscious about wanting to um, diversify uh, your own attitudes and your own network, you can do it. I hear a lot of people say, I can't do it. I can't find those people. I, I don't think that's true at all. I just think it takes work. I think it, you have to, to, to diversify one's own network, which is what you need to do to diversify your broader perspective. You have to work at it. You have to ask people if they'll talk with you and listen to them. And people will be happy to uh, teach you and spend time with you and answer questions because that's what that's human. We all want to talk about ourselves, but um, you have to put in the time. If you want, I mean, to come on, we have Internet, right? It's much easier right now yeah. today than Listen, back then, right? I'm in New York, and and you're. Are you, where are you in Brazil? In São Paulo. São Paulo. You? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so you're in São Sa Paulo. I mean, this is amazing, and isn't it a, a it's almost a crime to not take advantage of this? Like uh, last month, I had a, a a few calls with UX designers from Lagos, Nigeria. It was just so interesting. I learned a lot. And I learned a lot about how, like, how, how the community of UX people there it is challenged in ways that I've never seen a new community challenge before. I, I'm used to there being, going back to the 1990s, way more work, way more opportunity than we could possibly fulfill. And in, in Lagos, what I'm learning is a, a lot of the people there, because we don't allow for travel and we're, we're making it difficult for the supply of, of talent to meet the demand, they find themselves competing with each other. So they can't be collegial and mutually supportive in the way 
for each other in the way that I've seen so many young UX communities in the rest of the world be. And maybe it's similar in, in Sao Paulo. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I didn't know that. I'm really so glad I know that now. And it also helps me as a, you know, a publisher, as a conference producer. Um, you know, I understand how our products can fit or not in those markets in ways I would never have thought of before if I hadn't bothered to talk with people. But you've got to put in the work. If you can do that, if you can pull, bring up, get those skills, then you can succeed. If you can succeed in the world, then you should be able to succeed in a large, complex political organization. It's a lot smaller than the world. Because after all, we're designing for people, right? That's right. Yeah. And, and, and I, I love our keywords in this conversation, passion, seeking deep knowledge, connections, skills, and change capitalism. <laughs> This is amazing. And I can hear, I can hear your cat wrong, wrong. <laughs> oh, is it okay? Yeah, no problem. <laughs> I don't hear her, but it's a, a kind yeah, of <laughs> it's, uh, audio is pretty good. It's, it's a kind good. of re relaxed moment for us. <laughs> yeah. For a second there, I was like, what is that? Is, is that my cat? Yeah, because I have seven cats here. <laughs> seven? Oh, so, wow. Yeah, seven cats. They are I'm here. I'm down to one. <laughs> And uh, one last question. Uh, why did you decide to create your publishing house? Well, I, I'm kind of a, a, a natural entrepreneur. It's um, arguably the third business I've started. And um, I remember in around 2005, I just felt like UX is, is going to be real. It's going to grow. It's going to be a community and ultimately a profession. And yeah, you have to understand that the Polar Bear book was the first design related book that O'Reilly published. They didn't really want to publish it. They had to get convinced. And because uh, most of their books were very technical up to that point. And um, it wasn't really in their DNA and uh, to do design books. And there are other publishers at the time, some of whom have gone away since 2005, don't publish anymore. But at the time, the, the major ones, um, they were doing topics that were not like, some of them were, were UX, but some were a bit more like graphic design. And either way, um, I, I approached a number of them and I said, hey, I'm really interested in publishing uh, or editing a series of UX books. And, you know, I would find out from talking to them that to do uh, to be a series editor would um, be a lot of work and not much money. I mean, publishing is not an area anyone makes much money to begin with, but to be a series editor is all the work and, and none of the, the glory or money that uh, at least I get as a publisher with my name on the company. So I decided to start the company really as a hobby. And um, I got to apply a lot of UX practices to how we designed and tested our books from the very start. We did user testing or usability testing, I should say, on our books. We created a design system for our books back in 2005, 2006. And I wouldn't have been able to do that for an established publisher. Uh, and then I got to have fun and uh, it's still fun. And we're still using the same design system. <laughs> so uh, I'll call that a success. And the same quality I must add. The books are just amazing. Uh, speaking of the Polar Bear book, which is highly regarded as a Bible of information architecture and all that. Uh, what do you think changed between then and now in, in the field of information architecture? How, mm -hmm. how do you think the book affected it? What are your thoughts on that? Well, when the book, the book came out, it did really well because it was timed very well. It's not 
intentionally necessarily, but it was fortunate uh, that the first edition came out at a time when people were struggling, as I said earlier, with too much information, thank you to the web, uh, or about to get to that point of what information should they put on the web, on their websites. And um, these people were coming at this challenge from different perspectives. You had people like me who are librarians, people who were coming from uh, computer science, people who were graphic designers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, struggling with information uh, in this new medium this, you know, hypertext and all these things that were very new. And what we um, did for them with the book was we gave them a common vocabulary so that they could have conversations with each other. This complexity, as I said earlier, requires different kinds of brains to work together to solve those problems. That won't happen if people with those different brains can't have a good conversation. And so the book gave them common framework, uh, concepts, and vocabulary that they could use in a fairly straightforward, plain language way so that they could solve their own problems. Or we, we didn't solve the problems for them. We gave them enough language that they could. And, you know, the book is now in its fourth edition. The second edition came out, I guess, in 2002. It was a very different book, and it was designed for a new era where people already had websites that were exploding. And at that point, we were trying to give information architecture a bit more gravitas by sort of saying what it was as a profession as well as a practice. And then information architecture kind of went into what some people would say is a decline. They say died. And it's partly because the people who were talking about it 20 years ago went on to other things. Some of them got really involved in starting the interaction design community and profession. Some of them, like me, got tired of doing web information architecture or just wanted to move on to the next thing and so on and so on. And in any time you have a practice that, um, has um that is that is as i said earlier is systemic it goes beneath the surface people lose sight of it literally they don't see it and we weren't very good as a profession at, at addressing that we weren't always the most confident people in ourselves myself included and you know information architects were people who you know uh, to, to stereotype a lot of us we're female and we're set up to, to not have confidence culturally. A lot of us came from professions that were not like well regarded or rewarded compared to some of the more established professions that we were working alongside, like developers, even like graphic designers, marketers, data people. So we, we, we had a lot of things going against us, but to, to, to bring it back to today, I think there's a rebirth. I think people are now making the argument that information architecture is maybe bigger or will be than UX. I'm still wrapping my mind around that. I'm not saying I disagree and I'm not saying I agree. I'm being a weasel. I think it could be. But I, I don't think we have to have these conversations about fields of, of communities of practice and fields versus each other. I don't have, we don't have to say IA is better or worse or bigger or smaller than anything. That's not the point. The point is there's more information than there ever was. You can't not need information architecture when that's the case. And that's never going to change. Add that. I'm a loss. I'm at a loss of words right now because that that sums up sums it up just the best way possible. Thank you so much for that. No, I love talking about it, as you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that that was pretty evident. <laughs> Lou, it, uh, again, 
Thank you for your time, patience, and answers. As I comment, it's an honor to have these chats and moments with you. Thank you so much for this time. It was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to say uh, there's, there's people who are the real heroes are, are the ones that, having, that are having conversations like this. So thank you for inviting me to your conversation and keep it up. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thank you. And I hope to invite and bring you once again here with us. I love it. I've not been to Sao Paulo. I've been at CK, <laughs> and that's as close as I've come. Perfect. Maybe next year. Dude. Please be our guest. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's Thanks, it. gentlemen. All right. That was a lot of fun. Thank you. I hope that was what you were looking for. Yes. Oh, so, so much more. So much more. Sounds yeah. great. <laughs> Mr. Ed Novak, your first time here with us, and I have to ask you, what do you think? What are your oh, feelings my. about it? I, I I don't think I know words in English to describe what was like. But you can, with that guy. yeah, please, please uh, bring in Portuguese. Don't worry, <laughs> I will translate in some way. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just kidding. I know the words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I mean, it, it was amazing. What what else can I say? Uh, we were speaking with the guy who basically created information architecture as we know it today, and it was kind of a free workshop, sort yeah. of, I guess. I mean, what he said in the last part, like the emphasis he put on speaking to people and opening up to people and bringing those people along with you on the ride, man, that was that was not what I was expecting. But holy yeah. cow! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what a class, right? Yeah, I absolutely. Think he, yeah, his experience it's so amazing, and he he could brought for us uh, more than information architecture, right? His Way passion, uh, the message about seeking deep knowledge, uh, how important connections is, about skills, and the point that I love, change capitalism. <laughs> yeah, that, that, was, that was unexpected. Yeah, I was, I was cheering yeah. for that. Yeah. yeah, and just to you know, before the, the in the backstage, we spoke with him about uh, the elections, uh, and and the, the ice break was about that. So just you know, <laughs> it was a fun time. <laughs> we started off good. <laughs> yes, 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 and it was a great experience. His so kindness. Um, I think all our guests are so kindness, right? Open to answer, to to chat with us, patient about your uh, about our accent, but trying to build this connection so important, and they are so amazing, right, Ander? Yeah. You, you could you could felt this kind of feeling, right? I did, I did, yeah, and that that just serves to show how open the community is. And global, I mean, right? The global yeah, community, exactly. I mean, you can you can approach these guys on LinkedIn, on some other social media, and they they it might take a little while, but they they respond to you, they they talk with you, they they they're open to accept an invitation to a podcast down in Brazil. I mean, that's something, right? That shows something that, that tells you that they're open. And that the whole thing he said about opening up to people and bringing people together, it's it's not just just speech. It's not he's not just saying something pretty on the internet. He he he's doing that. He's living it. And that that's just amazing. Yes, yes, was amazing, and uh, yeah, like you said, this is an example. You are you are uh, you are connect with Deb Levitt, right? You 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 always send her messages, comments, right? Yeah, yeah we uh, we're not like best friends. Oh, but, yeah, uh, okay. we do talk from from time to time. We talk, we, we exchange a few words, and she's just a, such a a nice person. And so is Luis, 
And so is everybody, I guess. That's what we've been seeing from all the Good Morning UX episodes, right? Yeah. These people are just so cool. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we have to, to say that, Rafael, we miss you here. We, we know do. that. Unfortunately, like I said, Rafael can't come in this specific program. Uh, so I invite Eder to stay here with me because he's a big fan. Rosenfeld, Luis, Rosenfeld, big fan. So uh, we got this opportunity. So that's the reason. But Rafael, you come back. Don't worry. If you are a Buriti fan, don't worry. Don't be cry. <laughs> don't be sad. The screaming will be back. The screaming will be back. Yeah, Chill. yeah. Relax. But we always can change here because, for example, in Bom Dia UX, your Portuguese ver uh, version, we always change the the, the, uh, the the people there. So here, yeah, Camila, will be the same. Stepped up for you. Yes, yes. And tomorrow, I have good, good morning. UX in Portuguese, and and Rafael will not stay there, so will be Camila with me. Oh, cool! Yeah, Glad we are changing that. always your position <laughs> here, and it's very important to you know who you are watching us. You can stay here with me or Rafael. We can do that in the future. Let me think about it. Right, right, Andrew? Sure. Yeah. Why not? Why not? Why not? I'm up. I'm up. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Count on me, dude. Count on me. <laughs> well, but Edgar, I have to thank you for this time. It was amazing this experience with you. Uh, I think you, you brought good points and uh, it was amazing. Thank you so much for your time and <laughs> to your anxious. <laughs> My heart can take another one of those, dude. <laughs> Let me know a little bit earlier, maybe. Yeah, I yes, because I invite more. you yeah. this morning, right? Yeah, you did. <laughs> Sorry you about did. that. <laughs> we're good. We're good. We're good. But thank you so much. We, you, I appreciate you it. were uh, very important here with us. Uh, so uh, was was a great experience with you. And uh, the what is the message that we have to call our audi audience, please? Oh, that that's important. That's an important one. Like if you didn't go, it's it's free. It's just a click comment what you thought about the whole episode and this free workshop you just got and share and subscribe and send to everybody. Even those who are not designers, why not? So I like it. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the message. And that's it. Thanks so much. And I see you on the next episode of Good Morning UX. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.